to be able to assemble together and study your word, to have an opportunity to be concerned about those that we know. And we pray, Father, today that we'll be thankful that we've had the opportunity to be here at this place and to be your people. We pray, Father, for a number of people this morning that have been dealing with various health issues, for Darren Russell as he's had surgery. And we pray, Father, that everything will continue to go smoothly for him and things will get better. Pray, Father, for Palmer Spence as he's also had surgery this week and pray as he recovers at home that all will be well. Pray, Father, also for Jimmy Alsop as he's been sick for some time. Pray, Father, that as he's home, as his wife's home with him today, that he'll continue and that he'll be able to get better soon. We're so thankful, Father, that we have our health. Thankful, Father, that we have the ability this morning to be able to get out of bed, to be able to get ourselves ready, and to be able to assemble as your people. We pray, Father, that we will never neglect, that we will never neglect the opportunity that we have right before us today, that we will remember that opportunity comes in multiple forms throughout the week, throughout the year, and that we will take those opportunities that we have and that we will use them to the best of our ability, and that we will be ever so thankful, Father, that we can be called your children. Be thankful, Father, that we can think about the place that's called heaven, that has been prepared for us. And we pray, Father, that we will be thankful for the sacrifice that was made for us, the sacrifice that Christ made for us, and the sacrifice that you, Father, made for us, so that we could be at this place this morning, so that we could be with you for all of eternity. And we pray, Father, this morning that we'll be ever so thankful. As we're here today, Father, we pray that we'll do things that are acceptable in your sight. And we know, Father, how things can be accepted in your sight by looking at your word and determining what you expect from us in this life and inside of our worship and studies to you. We're thankful, Father, for that opportunity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, since I'm your substitute today, I want to spend just a little bit of our time, well, not a little bit of our time, all of our time looking at one book, and the only way to do that is to look at a short book. Um, so today I want us to do a quick overview of the book of Philemon. Matter of fact, we can look at most of the things inside of this book. It's a really interesting book, um, if you'll look at this particular book in its specifics. Um, it's a book written from Paul. The easiest way to know how a book's written is usually when Paul writes, you look at the first word. Well, when you go to Philemon 1, you see Paul is the very first name listed, and he references how he's writing this book and from where he's writing and what he's coming from as he's talking about his fellow laborers. Uh, it was written around 60 to 61 AD, which puts it in a nice little time frame for us to line up with the other books that Paul wrote. Uh, but it's his shortest book. It's only 25 verses. Uh, we could read it over and over and over a number of times in this class, in the 45 minutes that we have in this class this morning, and really get some repetition in there. But these 25 verses equate out to 445 words. And what I find interesting is it's 334 Greek words, um, which helps you understand how the language has to be expanded to a degree with the different ways that English works and the different ways other languages work. But it's a book that's short. However, it is a book that addresses a huge issue in the day that Paul, Philemon, Onesimus, Apthia, and Archippus all live. Those are the main individuals that are found inside of this book, three of which are a family, uh, Philemon and Apthia, and then Archippus, their son. Three are the family. Three are other uh, divided out, or two are others divided out in other ways, with Timothy being mentioned in verse 1, but you have Paul and you have Onesimus listed inside of this book as the individuals that are there. So when you're looking at the book, it's short. Uh, when you start looking at the book, you find that there are two main characters. There's Philemon, who is the one that the book is written to. And there is Onesimus. Now, sometimes you look at the book of Philemon, and you'll say that Paul is a main character of the book. And the answer is, he is a great character of the book. However, he is just the one writing the letter. So keep that in your mind. Paul is the one that's writing the letter because there is about to be a huge conflict between two people. One is Philemon, the other is Onesimus. So just for a minute, let's look at these two individuals and see some things that have to do with them 
that will help us define the conflict that's coming inside of their lives. Well, you look at verses 1 and 2 in the book of Philemon, and you find that Philemon is a resident of Colossae, a city that's talked about in a number of areas, a city that Paul has written some different books to already. But he is a resident of a regular city. I want you to see this. He's a resident of a regular city that's under control in Rome. Now, that will have something to do with what we discuss in just a few moments toward the end of the class with something that's happening with this great issue that's before them that was a regular issue among people who lived in the Roman world. Now, as you look down to verse 19, Philemon was one of Paul's converts. You look at verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Paul knew Philemon before. And you follow out the book and you'll learn that Paul most likely converted Philemon as you see it. Philemon was a man who was doing very well for himself in his life. His home, matter of fact, was the place where the church met. Uh, that's very foreign to you and I, isn't it? Uh, we've not met in homes very often, do we? Now, East Hill has an interesting beginning with the word home or house because where did East Hill first start assembling? In an actual home, remember? But remember, no one lived there when it was the home. This is Philemon's house. And the church came and assembled at Philemon's house. And that's where they met. And that's where the church met. And that's where worship took place. That's where preaching took place. That's where Bible study took place. Let me ask you this question. Would you do that in your home? That's right. That's right. That's right. So it's interesting here, we, we see his commitment to Christ because it wasn't convenient for him, but it was something that he could do. Now, he, here's point number one I want you to see inside of the book of Philemon. You're going to see that the individual characters that are listed, mainly Philemon and Onesimus, would do things and were willing to do things that we might not even consider doing. So I want you to see as you look at the book number one, the work that these people were willing to do for the cause of Christ. The church met in their home, and let me tell you, that had to be a great taxing thing. How many times when you have somebody over to your home, do you jump up and clean your house? Now imagine doing that every, every week or maybe even multiple times per week. We don't know how often or what the schedule was of which the church met in the home, but we do know it was a great thing that they did to have them in the home. Number two, we learn, or number four, we learn that Philemon was a very benevolent man. You look at verses five through seven, and you'll see that. And then finally, verse two, you will see he is, he is the father to Archippus. And by the way, Paul called Archippus our fellow soldier in the cause of Christ. Not only was he willing to do things that helped physically the church, but look at the son of Philemon, Archippus. He's not a main character. As a matter of fact, this is pretty much the last time we're going to mention him. But what did Paul, or how did Paul view Archippus? Well, verse 2, he was a fellow soldier. So what does that mean? Archippus was greatly working in the church. Now listen to the way I'm going to say this for just a minute, but, but, but Paul went everywhere, didn't he? Paul worked with anything, didn't he? And Paul did everything that he could in the cause of Christ. And look at who he's mentioned and look at who he's met is Archippus. Philemon not only had the church in his home, Philemon not only was a benevolent man, Philemon not only was a Christian, but look at how he... And, and, and pardon the way I'm going to say this, but it, it, it's the biblical way. Look at how he ran his household. I imagine that Aptheia had a lot of work to do to make it ready for the church to meet in the home. And his son Archippus was a great soldier in the cause of Christ. Does that not illustrate to you, at least it does to me, of how the home should be? 
especially considering the spiritual aspect of the home. This is probably the only occasion where we find an entire family fully devoted into the work of the Lord. The church met in the home. You know that was taxing on that home. The, the children of the home, the one we see here mentioned, Archippus. He was a great soldier in the cause of Christ. So what do you think was the center focus of this household? I would suggest you Christ would be the center focus, wouldn't you? I would say the church was the center focus. I think when you say the church and when you say Christ, you're, you're mentioning the same things. Because you can't have the church without Christ, can you? And you can't have Christ without the church. So they focus wholly on the things that they needed to be concerned with. So you have Philemon, he's one of the main individuals, and you also have Onesimus. Now, Onesimus is an interesting individual because Onesimus was not free. Now, keep that thought in your mind until we get to the end. Onesimus was not free. And we're going to make a great comparison to you and I as we get to the end of this particular class today. He was a slave who had run away, and most likely... You read this book and you study this book and he was most likely a man who had run away but also had stolen some things from Philemon. He fled to Rome. Well, guess what happens in Rome? Well, who, who was in Rome? Paul was in Rome. Well, a runaway slave runs to Rome, most likely has stolen money. Well, what does Paul do with that man? Paul converts that man. Paul turns that man into a Christian, which, by the way, helps us understand something about Christianity. If a runaway slave who had stolen from his master can become a Christian, can't we become and can't we stay Christians? There's a great principle in this book. This man who technically belonged to someone else. Now, I'm not agreeing that that's a good thing, and neither is this book. A man who had stolen from his master. We're not agreeing with that, are we? But what did he become? He became a Christian. Paul did not look through the lines of humanity and pick the group of people that he wanted assembling with the church. But how did Paul look at those that needed to be converted to Christ? He looked at them all, didn't he? Sometimes, if we're not careful, we will only choose to go after people that are like us. By race, by status in this world, by financial means. Paul didn't do that. You, you, you never see that in the life of Paul. But he was willing to convert anyone who wanted to become a Christian. Now, I don't know how these two met up. Paul in prison, most likely. Onesimus, a runaway slave. But Paul runs into him, and he was converted by, to Christ by Paul. Now, what's very interesting, you'll need to keep this in your mind as we go through this morning's class, but the name Onesimus, the name Onesimus means profitable. Profitable. Now, Paul is going to use the word profitable in a certain point in time, and he's going to say that Onesimus is profitable. Now, let me ask you a question. How can a runaway slave who had stolen from his master become profitable? He's a Christian. What's interesting inside of this book is it addresses a huge social problem. That problem was slavery, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons why that Paul is writing this letter to Philemon based on the common practices of the day of Rome. But that was a great problem. Matter of fact, as we look at the country that we live in, was slavery ever, ever a problem in the country that we live in? The ownership of human beings. Now, now I'm not equating the two to the same. I'm not saying that they were equal. I'm not saying that either are good because they are not. But it was a great problem. 
And what this book helps us understand is that the biggest problems in life can be answered in Christ. Every problem that we have can be answered somewhere in the pages of Scripture. If we boil this book down, what was the issue that was at hand? Let's make it as simple as it can be. We've got two men who had a relationship problem. Let's boil it down that way. We're not making this book anything that it's not. We had two men that have a disagreement. What are they supposed to do? Well, that's what this book is going to define out as we look at the book. As you look at the book, you're going to find three major themes that come across in this book. We're going to find the theme of forgiveness. We're going to th see the theme of barriers. And we're going to see the theme of respect. Now, when you look at all of these, there's something we need to notice. Number one, when it comes to forgiveness, here's the question that comes from this book. Can you and I forgive others? We should. Did not the closest to Jesus come and say, how many times should we forgive a man? Forgiveness is probably a principle or a topic that we discuss very little. In fact, I was looking at our sermon schedule and only a few times does the major theme of forgiveness come up in our sermon schedule over the last five years. Forgiveness. How many times are we supposed to forgive? What was the answer Jesus gave? 70 times 7. All right, what does that mean? It means as many times as it take. Now let me ask you a different question because how many times are we supposed to forgive is the easy question. How many times are we willing to forgive? And I'm, yeah, not many. And I'm not talking about the little things. Because let's face it, we boil things down into big things or little things. What do you think is happening between Philemon and Onesimus? Was it a little thing? <clears throat> or was it one of those big life problems that everybody knows about? Everybody's probably talked about. Not saying it's right or wrong, by the way. Everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen. That's the problem that's here. And here's the question. Can Philemon and Onesimus forgive each other? Forgiveness is a major theme in this book, but also barriers. You know, Christian love prevails all things. How does a slave owner and a slave inside of Christ work together? Well, Christian love prevails all things, doesn't it? Is there anything that the love of Christ cannot overcome? The answer is no. But how many times do we use the love of Christ to overcome the problems that we face? And thus we create barriers in this life. Someone does something to me and what do I do? I put up a barrier to that person. Someone else does something to me, I put up a barrier to that person. Before I know it, what's happened? I've got barriers everywhere, don't I? But inside of the love of Christ, it goes back to the idea of forgiveness, but it's deeper than that. Does Christ not give mercy? He does. Does Christ not give grace? He does. Does Christ not give forgiveness? He does. Does Christ not give instruction? He does. And those four things are tied together in a very unique way inside of this book to keep Philemon and Onesimus from putting up barriers because Paul tells Philemon, you've got to go home, which means something to you and I. Philemon, Onesimus, you have to deal with your problems. And finally, the major theme of this book is respect. Paul begs with respect. Matter of fact, verse 19, Paul says, whatever has been done, I will repay it. Evidently, Philemon had great respect for Paul. I don't know whether Philemon had respect toward Onesimus. And I do not know whether Onesimus had great respect toward Paul. But here's what I do know. Philemon and Onesimus, there was respect one to another. It went from Paul to Philemon and from Philemon to Paul. And therefore, Paul uses this respect as a conversation piece to help Philemon and Onesimus. In other words, there are times when we have to do uncomfortable things. So Paul, inside of these major themes, uses respect as an issue. 
By the way, should Christians respect one another? Just as an offshoot question here with the word respect. Should, should we not respect one another? Which makes us ask this question, what does respect mean? Does respect mean tolerate? Oh, it's way more than that. Does respect mean get along with? It's more than that, isn't it? What's respect? Honor, Honor I agree. Appreciation. What else is respect? Wouldn't we add to this wanting the best for someone else? Isn't that what is wrapped up in respect? Being willing to do anything for someone else, isn't that wrapped up inside of respect? And thus Paul uses this. He's willing to do whatever he can to help the relationship of two people of which he knows. Inside of the major themes, we also move to the major application. And, and here's the reality. This book is the perfect model of dealing with a sensitive subject in our social lives. Slavery, big issue. But here's something that's true. There are big issues in our day too. Though this is not a big issue in the culture of which we live, there are big issues in our culture, aren't there? And there can be big issues that become problems between Christians. Can you name me for just a minute some problems that could come between Christians? Hey, yeah. That can be an issue, can it? You're right. I have too. What else can come in between Christians? Politics. I love that word because I hate that word. <laughs> How many people like to play politics? Willard Carr loves to play politics, and I believe him all the way. We could probably have many discussions about politics, but, but we're, we're not talking about our United States political matters, are we? We're, we're talking about when we say politics among relationships, our relationships. And many times when you say you've got to play politics, it means you've got to be what? Compromise or, let me use this word, fake. So maybe there is an issue there that could be in our lives. What else could be in our lives? What else could be in our lives among Christians that are problems? Gossip. Probably the unspoken rule of Christianity. It's really not a rule, is it? But it is a thing, isn't it? Is gossip an issue? It, all right, just answer this question. Have you ever heard gossip before? All right, based on the smiles on your face, gossip is an issue. Can that come between Christians? Oh, the answer is yes, it can. So what you and I are learning is there are social things that happen among us, but also among society, that can become major issues between Christians. Courtesy. We could use that word. That's right. Christian courtesy, you're right. You know, that can be one of the issues. I believe that issue has faced the church before. And I believe if we're not careful, we'll think we're better than other people. By the way, that's part of the reason why I brought up Onesimus and Paul. Why did Paul convert Onesimus? That's right, but think about this. Let's make it a little bit deeper. Why did Paul convert Onesimus to Christ? There you go. And so many times we think we're better or have the potential to think that we're better than others, that we're not willing to go after the Onesimuses of this life. But they're out there. And what do they need? They need the Lord. They need the gospel. So inside of this book, we learn that through the principles that are found inside of Christ, any issue can be handled. Now, let me give you the end of this story. I don't know how it worked out. <laughs> I know that Onesimus goes home because Tychicus and Onesimus deliver the letter to Philemon. 
But we didn't get the second letter to tell us how it worked out. Now, now I want to play a, a, a little thought process here. How should it have worked out? Just as it should have, that's right. Onesimus and Philemon should have come to a mutual agreement about what must be done. And then that action must be done. Isn't that true? The truth is, it can work out. Now, I don't know whether it did or not. You don't know whether it did or not. You read the 25 verses of this. I, I don't know why. But I do know, verse 11, Paul says, Onesimus, he is profitable unto me. And he says that he is now profitable unto thee and me. Which means that Onesimus is now profitable to who? Paul and Philemon. Is that how we look at Christian converts in this life? Do we look at Christian converts as if they are profitable? Now, I understand something. Let me give a little side thought to this. I understand that there are always people who are trying to take advantage. I understand that, okay? I, I get it. I know it just as much as you do. But let me ask you this. Do we look at every person and do we try to determine that first? Maybe sometimes that's what we do. Or do we look at somebody and say they need the gospel? And we deal with the rest later. I believe the book of Philemon also helps us. This is major theme number two as we're talking about these other themes that go through this book. I think we can learn through the book of Philemon that you and I, there are a lot of people that we can reach out to. But sometimes we're willing, we are not willing to be uncomfortable to do it. And Paul was. So let's talk about something before we actually get into some of the verses that we want to look at today. Let's talk about Roman law because we mentioned this earlier about why the book was written in the way it was. And I believe it had to do with Roman law. Now under Roman law, a slave had no right of sanctuary. Why? Now I'm not saying we agree with this, but why did a slave not have right to sanctuary? He's a slave. Now, I want to say something very clear. Does that make it right? Because the law, which was the Roman law at the time, because of governmental law, if government says it's right, does that make it right? Well, no. So let me ask you this question. Can one human being own another? Now, the way you answer that is based on which law you regard the highest. If it's Roman law, the answer is yes. Because what does Roman law say? That slaves can be owned. But God's law doesn't say that. He had no right for sanctuary, but he could make an appeal to his master's friend for help, but nothing was guaranteed. So... Onesimus is making an appeal through who? The master's friend, which is Paul. Interestingly enough, Paul uses this principle, and we do not know whether that's the reason why Paul used this principle, but it does line up with the writing of this book, because what is this book really about? It's about one man pleading on behalf of another. And that was the Roman law, of which could be done for a runaway slave. There's something you need to think about, and we'll see this as we go through the book, but we are gods, but as people, we have sinned in the past, and we, in turn, fled and robbed him. Do you not see a great association between Onesimus and Christians? Do you see that? There's a great type taking place here. Those who are Christians at one time lived against Christ, but who took them back? Who took them back? God did, didn't he? Christ did, we could use the wordage. The question becomes, who's our advocate? And the answer is Christ. Paul was being the advocate for Onesimus toward Philemon, and Christ is our advocate 
between the Father and us. So let's look at the outline, and this is where we'll dig into the book. In the first three verses, you have the outline of this particular book. It's a rather simple uh, outline for us to look at. The first three verses, I'm sorry, you have the greeting. Paul just introduces things, verses 1 through 3, mentions who he is. He mentions Timothy, which he mentions in a number of his letters when he's writing. And he mentions uh, Philemon, of whom he's writing that, and he calls him our fellow laborer. And he mentions his family, verse 2, Apthe and Archippus, the fellow soldier. And he mentions the church, verse 2, that meets in his house. Now, I, I want to draw a question to you real quick. Would it be wrong for the church to meet in a house today? Okay, the answer is no. Then let me ask you this question. I'm going to be the devil's advocate for just a minute. Why do we meet here then? Convenient. You're right. I, I don't know many of us that have a home where 200-something people can come meet. Do you? No. I mean, you, 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 you've got to think about that for just a minute. But could, could there be ever a case where the church meets in a home? Oh, yeah, you're right. It is. I, I can list you at least two places overseas where the church meets in a home. Because that's the only place that the church has to meet. I've preached in one of them. The Amish people do it. Well, the Amish people are not following the laws of Christ. So I'm not here to talk about the Amish people. But here's what I know. It wasn't sinful. Now listen, I'm a great advocate of church buildings for a number of reasons. Number one, it gives us a place to assemble. Number two, it gives us a place to assemble, and I know we should not really use this word when it comes to church services, but it gives us a place to assemble and comfort. Think about this for just a minute. Uh, could 200 people go to the bathroom at your home? Okay, think it out. It's real simple. Could 200 people sit in an actual chair in your home? Could 200 people park in your driveway? Just think about what we're doing. You know, when we come to the church, we've got to remember that we want to be able to get here and we want to be able to fulfill all of our Christian duties while we're here, especially when it comes to worship and study. So think about that for just a minute. There was nothing wrong with that, but you and I are not meeting in the home. And I believe there's a reason why we don't meet in the home as a church of this size. How would the eldership oversee the flock if we all met in different homes? It's just they couldn't. They couldn't. So we're not arguing for small church groups. That's not what we're doing. But if the church met in a home, there would be nothing wrong with that. But understand, we sometimes break the bonds of that in our decision. So we have Paul's praise. This is verses 4 through 7. Now look at what's happening. Onesimus is a runaway slave. Onesimus most likely stole from Philemon. And Paul's writing a letter to who? Philemon. So what does Paul do? Number one, he praises Philemon. Sometimes inside of conflict, instead of condemnation, we need to give praise. Look at how it starts, verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the, com the communication of thy faith may be effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because thy the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Paul praises Philemon, for what he is doing. Now, what is Philemon doing? The church meets in his house. I believe verses 4 through 7 helps us understand the great taxation that would have been on that family to have the church meet in his house. Wouldn't that be difficult? We, we don't know how large the church was. We don't know how small the church was. But here's what I know. It changed their entire weekend. It changed everything that they did. It changed the way they used their home because the church had to have a place to assemble. And that would have been a very big priority for them inside of what they were doing. At that time, it was more convenient. At that time, I'm agreeing with you. It was. But at that time, there were also church buildings and other places that churches met in different areas. You know, as you look through Scripture, especially the New Testament, there are a variety of places where the church met in buildings. In homes, you go to First and Second Peter, the church met in caves sometimes in secret. There are a lot of places that the church met, which helps us understand something about the church. What is the church? It's the people. It's not a building. Now, just go with this thought with me for just a minute. If this building did not does not exist tomorrow, 
where would you be Wednesday? If this building does not exist tomorrow, where would you be Wednesday? We need to come. That's right. That's the answer. I don't know where we'd be, but we would need to congregate. I like that you used that word. We would need to assemble somewhere. Why? Because what are we? We are the church. And the great responsibility was upon Philemon and his family in providing a place for the church to meet. And in doing that, what happened to the church? Look at verse 7. The bowels or the church was refreshed. You went to sleep last night. Why did you do that? Because you needed to be refreshed. You're going to eat a meal today. Why did you do that? Or why will you do that? Because you need to be refreshed. You've assembled with the saints today. Why did you do that? Same reason. You and I need to be refreshed. Here's something that's true and that will always be true in the scope of time that we're living in. We're always going to need to be spiritually refreshed refreshed. The Roman society was very taxing. Now listen to the way I'm going to say this with respect. The American society is very taxing. Any society is taxing to the Christian. The question is why? Why is society difficult for the Christian? I don't think that's it. There's a problem out there. What's the problem? I thought I heard somebody say it. Sin. Sin is the problem. What does the world live in? Now, we're not judging the world and asking this question. What's the world living in? Sin. And how close can you get to sin before you entangle yourself therein? And that is why it is difficult for you and I more on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because Sunday should be your easiest day. Wednesday is the day to get you through the week. You spend less time in the church house than you do in the world's house. You understand the principle thereof? I'm not saying church building, but you spend less time with the church than you do out in the world. So this concept of refreshing, that means something. Which makes me beg this question. From the book of Philemon, how is the church refreshed? How is the church refreshed? We refresh weekly, but what do we do to refresh ourselves? That's right, at least weekly, maybe more than that. What do we do to refresh ourselves? Where does refreshing take place? Ah, thank you. Somebody did this. Why is this vital to your life? It does. But I think there's a real deep answer of why this is, should be and why this is important to your life, especially in the concept of your refreshing instruction. But th- th- think about this. This book is your greatest connection to God and who He is. He's not talking to people directly in the days of which we live. Now, there's, there's a problem that always happens in Bible class. I don't know if y'all know this. It's the problem of time. And we have three minutes to get through the plea, the pledge, and the, and, and, and the ending. Well, let me tell you what happens in the plea. Paul is going to say, let me take on Onesimus' debt. Let me take on Onesimus' debt. And here, here's the big question I had poised for that particular segment. Would you take on the debt of someone else? I'm not talking about physical debt here. Onesimus wronged Philemon, and Paul says, let me take the debt. I don't think he's referring specifically to the financial debt. I think he's referring to the problematic debt that Onesimus caused. Would you do that? Be mad at me, don't be mad at him. That's what Paul is saying. And Paul makes that pledge. He says, I'll repay everything to you. He said, I want to come see you. Verse 22, he says, get get a lodging ready. I want to be with you. It's his outlook on who Christians are and who he wants to be around. And thus, verses 23 through 25, he he salutes certain people. And by the way, verse 24, Demas, uh, many scholars suggest this is the same Demas that Paul writes about later and says, for Demas hath forsaken me. By the way, Demas is faithful at this time, at least to Paul. And then the book ends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, be with your life. I don't know how the book ends. I, I don't know, do you? 
But here's what I do know. Everything inside of this book is pointing to the fact that Christians can get along no matter what. Don't you agree with that? Does everybody agree with that? Does anybody disagree with the premise and the principle of this book? Christians can get along. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Now the question is, is that easy or is that hard? And I'll help you, it's hard, isn't it, sometimes? Sometimes we make it harder than it has to be. Sometimes we do things that we should not. It goes back to the problem of sin. But the truth is, everyone can be reconciled inside of Christ. That was what Paul was wanting for Onesimus and Philemon to come together and to be one inside of what? Inside of Christ. So you see inside of the book of Philemon the power that's found in Christ and the beauties that are there. I appreciate today you uh, spending time with me in this class. I know this is not what you were uh, studying last week, won't be what you're studying next week, uh, but come in just a short few weeks. We will open up a new class here in the auditorium, uh, and we'll be uh, there sooner than we really think. Uh, so I look forward to the time that we get there. I'll be releasing soon in the bulletin um, what we will be studying so you can get prepared and things of that nature for the new class that's coming. So be looking for that in the bulletin, and we'll try to also make sure we get it on the rotating announcements uh, just in case you don't see it in the bulletin of that upcoming class. Uh, thank you so much for your participation today and your comments, and things will get back to normal uh, here next week, and then we'll make a transition soon. Thanks so much.